Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, there's a, uh, a common theme that is found in all three of our scripture readings this morning. A theme that can be summed up with really just one word. And that word is the word stress. Let me explain. In our Old Testament reading, we find the Lord God giving Job an answer of sorts. And the reason why the Lord is answering Job is because, well, Job has been stressing out, if you will, over a very complicated theological question. You see, Job is searching for an answer as to why God the Father would allow his children to experience suffering. Job is stressing out over that age-old question of why. Why me? Why me, he asked, because severe suffering and intense pain has fallen upon him and his household. And then moving on to our epistle reading, the Apostle Paul relays the stress, if you will, that is associated with carrying out the work of ministry. Among other things, he mentions how he has experienced sleepless nights. Now, I'm no doctor or sleep disorder specialist, but I know enough about insomnia to tell you that one of the chief causes of a sleepless night is that of stress. And then finally, here in our gospel reading, the Lord's disciples find themselves in a very stressful situation as they are caught in the midst of a severe storm while stuck in a boat out in the middle of the open water. Their stress seems to be even further compounded by the fact that they perceive that Jesus, who is there with them, albeit asleep, doesn't even care about their plight. How about you? Can you uh, relate to these situations, these feelings that are expressed here in our readings today? What causes stress in your life? Are you like uh, Job, wondering why? <laughs> why God would allow you to experience what may appear to be an extra measure of suffering in your life? Are you like the Apostle Paul, perhaps having difficulty getting a good night's sleep because something is weighing heavy upon your mind? Are you like the disciples, doing all you can to stay afloat while at the same time wondering if Jesus even cares as to whether or not you survive? You know, my friends, there is some information supplied in our gospel reading here today that most of us would probably completely overlook if it were not pointed out to us. What I'm referring to are the words that we find at the end of verse 36, where it says there were also other boats with him. Think about that for a moment. There were also other boats there with him. In other words, unlike uh, how we may have pictured this story from our Sunday school class days, where we probably just saw one boat, right, with the disciples and Jesus in it, well, as it turns out, there were also other boats, St. Mark tells us, caught in that storm. Isn't that interesting? Commentators theorize that Mark mentions these other boats so that we, we could read ourselves into this story as though we too were there in that storm. And you know the truth is we can read ourselves into this story as we too know what it's like to be stressed out in the midst of all the chaotic and fearful things taking place around us. 
And tell me, is it just me or have any of you noticed that the fears that people seem to experience sure seem to have intensified over the years? To give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, consider this. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University reported that in the 1960s, the greatest fears among grade school children were these five items. Mean animals, like that of a vicious dog, being in a dark room, high places, strangers, remember your parents telling you not to talk to strangers, and loud noises. Now, granted, those kinds of things can be frightening, especially to grade school children, I suppose, but by and large, those things are also fairly innocuous. But now consider the results of that research that was then gathered 30 years later. 30 years later, and that would be in the 1990s, researchers found that the greatest fears among that same group of grade school aged children had changed. They were now parents divorcing, nuclear war, cancer, pollution, and being mugged. That's quite a contrast in a really short 30 year span. However, as you certainly know, the 1990s were nearly, what, 20 years ago. So what do you suppose that list would look like today in the year 2015? Well, I don't have an answer for you for that one, but about 10 years ago, a study was done on this same subject by a professor, Joyce Burnham, and she found that the fears in children of that age group grew even more intense. Professor Burnham's list of the greatest fears among grade school children uh, right around the year 2005 were these. Terrorism, being kidnapped, or as they say, abducted, being raped or molested, contracting AIDS or other sexually transmitted diseases, and dying, dying. Isn't that interesting to see how death now has crept into the picture as a fear for young people, considering the fact that they are a group that has in the past been somewhat immune from that concern due to their young age. But with things like terrorism and war, along with more violent crimes being reported in our what, 24-7 news networks that we have on TV? Things like uh, that tragic shooting in the church down in South Carolina. Children are seeing death as something that can and has indeed invaded their world. But even though death is sadly now a big worry, a lot of anxiety for young children originates, believe it or not, right from the home front. In a recent article found in Time magazine, psychologist Lawrence Cohen writes, I think many parents have put themselves and their children into an anxiety-producing corner. They want their children to be academically successful and always happy and creative and socially popular and emotionally sound, he goes on to write, it's an impossible demand. The inevitable result is anxiety. You know, my friends, as great as the fears are that people of all ages face, there is something that we have a tendency to forget as Christians. And that is the biggest problem by far we face, is actually not terrorism or the economy or any of the other headlines we hear in the news for that matter. No, the biggest problem we all face is something far more damaging than stuff like that. You see, the biggest problem we face 
is a spiritual problem. It's the battle, if you will, for our souls. It's the problem of sin that has entered into our world and has separated us from God and has brought eternal, not just temporal, but eternal death and destruction. As our Lord himself said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. But you know, even though we have a tendency to forget about that big, big problem, our gracious God hasn't forgotten. No, out of his great love for us, he addresses that problem. Let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about here by making what they call a textual observation for you. That is just looking back here at our gospel reading and looking at the text of it again. Because in our gospel reading, and you can answer this question, I'm sure. I know a, a young person could anyway. Who is found sleeping there in our gospel reading? It's Jesus, right? But now what I'd like you to do is to fast forward to the scene where Jesus is there in the Garden of Gethsemane praying in desperation to the Father on the night before his crucifixion. In that scene, which is recorded in Mark chapter 14, so we'd page ahead a few chapters, now who is sleeping? It certainly is not Jesus, no. After praying to the Father about the bloody, the painful ordeal involved in procuring the salvation of the world. It says there in Mark chapter 14, verse 37, Then Jesus returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. Isn't that an interesting contrast? During this storm, the disciples panicked while Jesus slept. But when it came time to contemplate the cross as the payment for our sin, why then it was the disciples who were found sleeping. And Jesus is in turmoil. What does one make of that contrast? Well, when we compare those two situations, it does make you think, it does make you realize that Jesus must have seen more danger to the soul in the struggle with sin than in the hazards of nature. Dear friends, that's important for us to keep in mind because when problems in life seem big, and boy, do they ever at times, and God, he appears to be small or perhaps not even existing, well, maybe what needs to happen is we need to change our perspective and to look at things in a brand new way. That is, to look at things in a spiritual way, from a biblical perspective. I'm not suggesting that we deny the reality of the problems in our world. After all, there are certainly a lot of problems that we do face. And it does not help to minimize them. However, that being said, let's not forget that the fundamental problem that we face is that of sin. You see, sin is the root of all that has gone wrong in our world as well as in our lives. And it's a big problem that requires an even bigger solution. Indeed, a solution that no one, not a one of us, other than God, can supply. And there on the cross of his son, Jesus Christ, God provided that solution for us. As the Apostle Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him 
graciously give us all things. Yes, my friends, the one who can calm the stormy sea with the shout of his voice, quiet, be still, is the same one who can calm our troubled souls. Also, with the power of his holy word. His word that assures us that no matter what we face in this world, we are completely forgiven, and therefore we are saved, both now and for all eternity. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.